Hi, my name is Adam Franklin Lyons and I teach history here at Marlboro College. And today I'm going to talk to you about primary sources. I'm going to give you a quick definition and then I'm going to give you a couple of examples that illustrate both why they're so important and how historians use them to learn things about the past. So first the definition. Historians talk about primary sources and secondary sources. A secondary source is anything made by someone today describing the past. So whatever a historian writes, any books or videos, this video that you're watching right now is a secondary source. It's one historian, namely me, and their take on the past and how it works. You've all read secondary sources. Any textbook or lecture or reading history on Wikipedia, all of those things count as secondary sources. But for a practicing historian, usually these secondary sources take the form of books or articles and journals. Now, primary sources are the items that we use to build narratives about the past. They are items or documents or writings from the time period that we want to investigate. They are direct witnesses. They provide our best window into a time that we ourselves have not experienced. Now, unlike secondary sources, for primary sources, there is no standard form. They can be almost anything. Primary sources are often texts, books about theology, personal letters, laws, grocery receipts, wills, school books, anything written down or created by someone in the past that provides part of the information I need to understand their life and the time they lived in. Primary sources also include physical remains. Historians, often working with archaeologists or scientists, have used bones and teeth to investigate the plague or other diseases, tree rings to look at historical climate and weather patterns, and even village waste piles. And yes, I mean both trash heaps and human waste to look at the diet people consumed hundreds of years ago. So think about what you flush down the toilet and what that would say about you if a historian or an archaeologist got a hold of it. Now, I'm a medievalist, which is actually really great because it's a time period with both a fair amount of written documents, but also with extensive archaeology. Now, I have a few examples of really compelling primary sources from the medieval period. I'm going to do two in this video and one in the next video. All of these are written texts, but if you want a good introduction to non-textual evidence, things that aren't documents, one really excellent place to start is to go look at how art historians read paintings. And there's a couple of links below for art historians talking about artworks that I think are great. Now, our first source is really, really famous. See, skilled Beowulf, led them down to the beach's fringe. I am Beowulf! That's right, Beowulf. Here, what you were looking at on the screen is the first page of the earliest manuscript of Beowulf. You've probably heard of Beowulf, maybe you've seen one of the movies or read a comic book. It's a classic story. Hero, that's Beowulf, leaves home to seek his fortune. He responds to a plea from the great King Hrothgar to kill a monster who they call Grendel, who's terrifying his kingdom. Beowulf shows up, he fights Grendel barehanded in the mead hall, he tears his arm off, and Grendel flees to, to go die of his wounds. Then Grendel's mother begins terrorizing the countryside, so Beowulf has to enter her cave and fights her also, again successfully. He is showered with gifts, he becomes a great leader himself, eventually he returns to his own people to become their king. And then, in the last part of the text, he's called to do battle with a great dragon who's been killing people in the surrounding villages. He begins the battle alone, but it goes badly for him. And then all of his men abandon him but one, Sigloff, who comes to his aid. And together they kill the dragon, but Beowulf is mortally wounded in the process. And the end of the poem is Beowulf's own funeral and the singing of his praises. Now, in between the fights, there are meditations on worldly values, the qualities of great leader, cautions against pride, discussions of kinship, and the connections between families in England and Scandinavia. Beowulf has come from Scandinavia to Geatland, which is where the main story takes place. So it's a rich and wonderful story. It's really well known today because it has so many retellings, movies, graphic novels, parodies, Beowulf versus Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, yeah, all right. I've chosen this as our first primary source because it's a great example of how we sometimes have only very few actual examples to work with. In the case of Beowulf, this is not only an early manuscript, here's that first page again, it's written probably more than a thousand years ago, it is the only known manuscript from that time period. It wasn't until 700 years later that it was transcribed, translated, written down, and generally began to be distributed. Not only that, 
but for several centuries, the manuscript was in the private collection of a wealthy family in England, the Cottons. One of the early leaders of the family, Sir Robert Bruce Cotton, was a major collector of any early English manuscripts, and he bought the volume with Beowulf for his personal collection in the early 17th century. In 1731, the library owned by the Cotton family had a fire, and many texts were completely lost. Beowulf was badly damaged, though recovered. So imagine, a few errant buckets of water, a small change in wind, there would be no Beowulf. No films, no story, nothing. The Hobbit might be a completely different tale if Tolkien, who I should note was a scholar of early English literature, had never read Beowulf. You remember that last monster, the dragon? The dragon begins burning down the surrounding villages because a slave stole a golden cup from a horde that the dragon owned. Sound familiar? There you are, thief in the shadows. So back to the actual book itself. Beowulf, this one volume, is the source of a massive amount of cultural production. It was in libraries for centuries while the entire world changed around it. The construction of Gothic cathedrals, the exploration of Columbus to Gama and all the rest, European colonialism. The first copy of this manuscript was made in 1786, after the American Revolution. We don't even know if anybody read it before that. So that's a good example of just how random the survival of some of our sources is. And if you want to learn more about Beowulf, you have to read Beowulf. There is other Old English literature, but not a huge amount. Beyond the other works of literature from the time, there are famous hordes of treasure. Here's a pretty good image of a couple of famous pieces that we have found that feel so reminiscent of those described in the text. There are other archaeological remains. We have ships, we have burial mounds, like they mentioned in the poems and villages that you can read about. But if you've read Beowulf, you've got a pretty good start to knowing the main text, and that's kind of amazing. Now, before I wrap this video up, I want to show you one more source, at least briefly. Here again is that first page of Beowulf. It's written originally in Old English, which is pretty different than Modern English. You can pause the video if you want to see if you can make out some letters. But basically, it's a language that people have to study like any foreign language to be able to read. So it's really important to know the language of your document and how to read them. And there's an increasing number of translated and published documents, but there remain thousands that are only available in the form that you're looking at now. And really, for me, this is one of the most fun parts about reading historical documents, is holding a piece of very old parchment or paper, sometimes hundreds of years old, and trying to piece out what a document actually says. You can see how the margins of the Beowulf manuscript have been repaired, but the edges of the words in some cases are permanently lost. Now, if you've ever had a bad photocopy with the words chopped off, or if you take a book and just cover up the last half of the words at the end of the line, you can usually guess pretty accurately what the word is going to be, but not in every case. So that's at least part of what it's like to read original sources, or to read the original manuscript of Beowulf. But really, if you want to practice yourself, I mean right now, I have a different manuscript for you. This is a page from John Wycliffe's English translation of the Bible. Wycliffe was a religious reformer in England during the 14th century, about 100 years before the Reformation. That's another story if you want a fuller description of his life. I talk about him in another lecture, and there's a link to that below as well. Suffice to say, he prepared a complete edition of the Bible in English, translated from the standard Latin Vulgate edition used almost exclusively in Western Europe at that time. The edition was condemned because of supposed inaccuracies or malicious changes that Wycliffe made, but we still have more than 100 copies of this edition. That's way more than Beowulf. So here's a page of it. Hit pause and see if you can read some. I've put a transcription in the notes below, so you can refer to that if you feel like you're totally stuck. But try doing it yourself first, just to see how it goes. It's Middle English, so the spelling is a little funny, but it should be legible as English. Oh, and one note, there's a character that we don't use anymore called a thorn. It basically looks like a Y, but it's pronounced T-H. But there's several in this manuscript, so keep that in mind as you try to figure out what it says. I recommend starting with the big capital I, a little more than halfway down. Good? All right. Hopefully that was a fun exercise. It's something I do all the time. So that's the end of part one. I've given you a couple of examples of primary sources and a definition of what we mean by that. And both of these sources are important in and of themselves, but not all sources have such grandiose stories. In part two, we're going to look at a letter between two merchants that in and of itself is not that important, but we're going to talk about how historians collect sources together to aggregate stories out of them. So thank you for watching, 
and I'll see you in video number two.